We're going to discuss the adaptive immune response. Uh, Ian, are you still here? Yes, sir. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to use you as an example. I'm going to say we're going to I think this way it will be easier to kind of for you guys to understand it. Otherwise, uh, you know, we talk about like, you know, make believe, you know, things. So imagine imagine Ian, right? He graduates the paramedic program and he successfully passes, you know, his exams and he's now, you know, New York City paramedic. He's very happy, right? And he wants to celebrate. So he he, he says, uh, you know, first I want to cel celebrate with my family and then I'm going to celebrate with my classmates. So he says, you know, I'm going to take all my family members. I'm going to treat them to a barbecue in the park, right? That's what he says. So they, you know, they get all the food, you know, they get... Uh, you know, all the grills, he has all his family members, and it's summertime, right, weather is warm and beautiful, so he goes to the park, and we're going to say there's a lot of uh, uh, pollen, right, in the air, so all of them are inhaling pollen, right, so we're going to say this is Ian's lungs, Right, and he happened to inhale some, you know, pollen in the spark, right? That came in. And we're gonna say this is your bronchioles. This is your, you know, goes into your trachea, right? So normally, uh, as you guys know, right, we have these uh, cilia, right, that's found on the surface of your bronchial cells, right? What's the uh, purpose of the cilia? Anyone can tell me. To remove the particles, it's the, yeah. uh, like the escalator response. Excellent, right? So, Alunzi says, right, uh, there's a mucociliary escalator. It's going to coat, coat that, you know, and with, let's say, goblet cells, they're going to secrete, right? They're going to secrete. Right? They're going to... They're going to basically encode this particle and the upbeating of this cellular escalator is going to basically move this particle up, right, back into your throat. And then hopefully, right, it's going to go into your esophagus and then that particle goes to your stomach and your body, right, in the stomach, it's very uh, low pH, very high acid. It's going to basically break that particle up and you have no problem, right? So that particle gets one fate of it will be uh, uh, basically uh, surrounded with mucus by the goblet cells, move through the cilia escalator up to your uh, throat, goes into your esophagus, gets digested in your GI tract, right? Done. The second, the second fate of this is, remember we talked about monocytes that are now found in your, right, circulation, uh, not circulation, that are out of your circulation, that are found in your tissues, especially in your lungs, right? What what are these monocytes called? Macrophage. Yeah, macrophages. So so Ian, the second fate of this, Ian can have alveolar macrophages. Which gonna basically engulf that particle. They're gonna, you know, bring it inside, and then those non-specific granules with lysosomes they're going to secrete their you know chemicals and they will basically phagocytize the that uh, particle uh that pollen grain that came in is gone right so it's possible two fates right one fate uh, was this goes in the stomach gets destroyed the other fate the the macrophages basically eat them up right alveolar macrophages and their job is to basically patrol uh these long tissues and find these foreign invaders right but we're going to say in in case something else happens right Unfortunately, uh, neither uh, case number one or case number two happens. What happens is, and I'm going to uh, take, make it bigger. What happens is, unfortunately, one of the macrophages, I'm going to make it bigger, right? So th this is your macrophage. And specific, I should say it's alveol alveolar macrophage, right? What happens is this... Uh, Pollen grain came inside. So it came in in the phagosome. We're going to say this is your pollen grain. And it tried to, you know, 
break it up, right? And we're going to say this is the nucleus. But unfortunately, it didn't phagocytize it. Instead, what happened is it has these MHC class 2 molecules, uh, membrane histocompatibility complex 2, right? And what it did was it moved these uh, antigens of this grain pawn to the surface. Well, let's say this is the surface of your alveolar macrophage, and it expressed this uh, right on the surface. Let's say we'll do it like this. I'm going to take a different color. So on the cell surface, what it did was it expressed its class two molecule, uh, which is holding right this pollen grain antigen on its surface. And then it, it does something uh, which is, in a way, you know, it's good for your body, but in this case, it's really, really bad. It took this to a T cell. So here I'm going to say you, this is your T cell. And specifically, if you want to be specific, this is your T helper cell. Type 2, right? So what it does is, is brings this to your T helper cell. And the T helper cell has, uh, has a receptor here. This is called T cell receptor on the surface. And it also has a receptor that's going to recognize this MHC, MHC molecule number two. Right? So this is the T cell receptor. This is the CD4 receptor. The, the names of this is not as important uh, in terms of, you know, the names of this, but so that you understand, right? So what, what happened is this pollen grain was uptaken, right, with phagocytosis by macrophage. Instead of phagocytizing it, it processed this uh, foreign pollen grain on the cell surface. It expressed it antigen on the surface with class two MHC molecules. Then it took it to a T helper cell and it docked basically on this T cell receptor with CD4 protein. And this, when the moment this occurs, this T cell activates its internal machinery, right? So internal machinery of the T cell is activated and it basically starts to make uh, uh, interleukins. It's basically the way we call them is uh, uh, sig cell signal signaling molecules or cytokines. So cytokines, cell signaling molecules, they do have specific um, um, names, right? So the cytokines here, right, the moment this occurs is interleukin type 2. And this interleukin type 2 gets released from the T cell. It docks on interleukin type 2 receptor on its cell surface. And this basically what it does is this makes the T cell, the T helper cell, very, very active. The moment this T cell is very, very active, it starts to secrete other interleukins. So we have uh, interleukins, uh, which are cytokines, interleukin type 4, right? Interleukin type 4. That's come, that comes out, we also have interleukin type 5. So we're going to see what they're going to do, right? So the first thing that it does is, here we have our B cell. We're going to say this is our... B cell, and right now this B cell is inactive. This is a B lymphocyte. This cell is not active. And on this uh, cell, right, we have uh, different antibodies. And this antibodies, right, that are on this B cell are different than, let's say, on this B cell or this B cell, right, or this B cell. The receptors here must be very, very specific to that incoming antigen, right? The epitopes of the antigen must specifically match. So we're going to say we finally found a specific B cell where this antigen that was coming in, right, on this pollen, and it also binds here. And it perfectly matched it. So this B cell is now going to be activated very shortly. So this pollen grain that's here is now uh, bound to it. 
when this pawn is bound to it, what is gonna what you're gonna see is this interleukin type four is gonna come and it's gonna find the receptors here. Interleukin four receptors. And what it's gonna do is gonna make this B cell multiply. And as this B cell multiplies, we call this clonal expansion. It starts basically making more of itself, right? It starts to make more of it of itself, right? And then as the clonal expansion is occurring, interleukin-5 is going to come and bind on these cells and it's going to signal basically these cells to become plasma cells. So these cells are going to start to become plasma cells. And plasma cells are your activated uh, B cells. And the purpose of activated B cells is this. Their whole purpose is now start to make antibodies. So they start to produce antibodies. And in this case, they produce uh, IgE, right? Specific antibody for these particular pollen grains, right? So they, and, uh, they make a lot of them. So they make a lot of these antibodies. So let me let me uh, so far recap where we are at this you know point right. So uh, we had you know Ian who went to barbecue. There was garden there, and he inhaled some pollen grains, and his the pollen grain that came in. Unfortunately, the cilia did not move him via the ciliary escalator to destroy it in the GI in the GI tract, or they didn't phagocytize and break that pollen grains. Instead, what happened is that macrophage inappropriately, right, processed this pollen grain with type 2 uh, molecule and expressed it on the cell surface. So this antigen of this pollen grain is now expressed on the surface along with type 2 uh, MHC molecule. Then this macrophage took this uh, information to a T cell, T lymphocyte. And it docked on the T cell receptor and CD4, right, uh, receptor site. And this set sent intracellular signals to basically, uh, it does uh, a couple of things. A, it starts to secrete these cytokines, right, which are interleukin type 2, which activates the cell. And by the way, when the interleukin type 2 activates the cell, we also have more of, of these T cells. More of them are made. Right, so more of these are made. This is also called clonal expansion, expansion of T cells. And the whole purpose of this is that we make more, more, and more of this, so that more of these intercellular signals can be sent. So one signal that it sends is interleukin type four, and another signal it sends interleukin five. These are cytokines made by these T cells. Uh, the moment these are made, right, these interleukins type 4 is going to come on the B cell, on the B cell receptors, right? And if this pollen grain is also attached here on these uh, antibodies, it's going to signal this B cell and to go to B cell clonal expansion. The moment the B cell starts to expand, interleukin 5 is going to come here, activate these clonally expanded cells. Clonal expansion means it makes more of itself. The more, the more of itself it makes, interleukin-5 is going to come and say, time for you to become a plasma cell, right? Plasma cell. And what plasma cell is, is basically it's an activated B cell. And now it starts to make IgE antibodies against that pollen, against that pollen grain. Any questions so far? So this is where we hear... The term clonal antibody therapy with COVID patients. Uh, so uh, that is slightly different. I, I they provide them right a antibody therapy with already made antibodies against that. I don't want to against this particular uh, virus, but I don't want to get into that right now. Let's just explain the basics first. But y yeah, in a similar way, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. So for now, right, we're at the point where the B cells are basically uh, making these, right, antibodies. 
and let me add another page here right so let's see what happens next right next uh ian asked me right what is these mast cells right so we also have mast cells that are found normally in your body right so let's say this is your mast cell right this is your mast cell they're made by the bone marrow and they're predominantly found in your connective tissue they are all over our connective tissues especially right especially we see it in the lungs right we see this mast cells in our skin skin lungs we see it in our stomach right gi tract we also uh see it in our circulation right in the thelial cell so this is what this is our circulation and we see these mast cells right there on these endothelial cells in the connective tissue so this is the mast cell right so and and they're normally found there uh in our body all the time right that that what happens however because uh ian in this case his body made these ige antibodies what they will do is they will go and they will attach themselves on these mast cells so far ian is not having any type of reaction all he has done is he went to the garden right his macrophages inappropriately expressed right uh this on the surface and then his uh, b cells start to make these ige antibodies which are now are coming and connecting to the mast cells and you see right all these mast cells in your circulation and now they get loaded with all these right ige antibodies right so this is what's what's happening so far ian is not having any you know allergic reaction anaphylactic reaction or type 1 reaction so far he's normal he's enjoying his barbecue right and uh you know everything is is, is fine right he's having a good time however right uh you know he says you know that was a good party but now like all my classmates who I also became paramedics i want to celebrate with them so i want to take him to the barbecue right so he again buys you know all the food he gets you know everyone together so all of you right uh all of the classmates all of you who became paramedics you guys are going together for the same barbecue but the difference between the first time and the second time let's say about 10 to 15 days passed and that's how much time you need about you know two weeks 10 to 15 days to have right uh, your uh, b cells start to make these antibodies and these antibodies are now attaching to these mast cells right so this is this is what happened so far right so now let me draw uh, uh i'm gonna take you know i'm gonna take his uh bronchial muscle of the lung so we're gonna say this is his lung i'm gonna make this bronchi big right so this is your bronchial tree and what do you see right so inside we uh, will have um the air spaces we want to say these are your goblet cells Right, this is your airspace in here. Here we see cir circulation, right? This is your uh, pulmonary capillaries. Right, and then we also have the smooth muscle, right? Your bronchial smooth muscles that are found here. And then we see these uh, mast cells, right, that I was drawing here, right? We see these mast cells, right? And they're in this connective tissues, and they're surrounded in these connective tissues. So you see these, and there's a lot of these mast cells. And they're all of these connective tissues, 
And but the problem is is that now they're expressing what? So in, the, in before they were not expressing these IgE antibodies, but now they are. Because it has been several days, right? And that's what's occurring. So all of them have this IgE. And they're against that particular pollen grain that's found in that particular uh, garden, right? So this is this is what's inside of Ian, right? This is his, I'm going to say this is his lung. This is his bronchial smooth muscles. Let me draw a lung here. So this is his lung, right? And this is just a cross-section of his bronchial tree, right? So... And so Ian goes back to this barbecue, and then again he goes to the garden, and what happens is he again inhales, right, that, that pollen, and that pollen makes its way to this airspace, right, and there's pollen grains that are coming in, but now there is a problem. So this pollen grain as this is coming in, it's going to come and it's going to cross-react with these IgE antibodies. They're going to come and adhere, right, to these pollen grains because now his body been sensitized right and his body already has this IgE right so you will say okay so you know what's the problem so what's the problem with this so let's let's talk about the problem so I'm gonna here I'm gonna say this is the I'm gonna erase some of the stuff I'm gonna keep the mast cell right With these, uh, and we're gonna show right. It's um, membrane, right? So here we go, right? So this this mast cell it has IgE antibodies, and now the pollen grain has bound here, 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 and has cross-linked, right? Cross-linked these IgE antibodies and the moment it does this it's going to this is going to send some signals uh, on the mast cells so the first thing it does is it releases histamine so these mast cells that are found in his uh in his connective tissues right are starting to secrete histamine so histamine has a couple of properties that it does so number one it's very potent very very potent um, it's posmogenic. So what this is going to do is going to work on his smooth muscle and it's going to cause those muscles to spasm, right? They're going to start to spasm. In addition, uh, this is a vasodilator. So his, his, his uh, capillaries here, right? are going to dilate and they're also going to become leaky. So his capillaries, instead of looking like this, right, they're going to start to, right, look like, like that. And they're going to start to ooze, right, some of the contents into his air spaces. In addition, right, what, is, what else is going to do is it's going to increase secretions from his uh, gut blood cells. So these cells that we have, the gut blood cells, they're going to start to secrete more. They're going to make, they, they're going to produce more and secrete more into the air spaces. Right, so we're still we're still not finished, right? So histamine is produced. It created spasmogenic effect of of uh, smooth muscle constriction. It's a vasodilator, so it dilates these vessels. So you have more fluid, more edema, edema formation that's coming. You have hypersecretions of the gut blood cells of the mucus, and all of a sudden, Ian is not looking so good, right? He starts to uh, have what. As, as these effects are ongoing, he starts to develop signs and symptoms of wheezing, right? And he starts to develop symptoms of dyspnea. 
right? So he he is not having such a great time on this barbecue, right? Uh, but that's his you know subsequent uh, you know exposure to uh, that uh, uh, pollen grain, right? In addition, right, this uh, um, surface of the cell is going to also uh, secrete uh, cytokines known as leukotrienes. It's basically, uh, it's going to come from the arachidonic acid and then the two pathways being the uh, cyclooxygenase pathway, right? And uh, it's going to go into the leukotriene pathway. So leukotrienes, what are leukotrienes? Leukotrienes are very, very, very strong spasmogenic and very strong bronchoconstriction bronchoconstrictor so they're also going to work on these smooth muscles and they're going to start to vasoconstrict him even more this is way warm this leukotriene right uh way more potent than histamine so these are way 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 more potent they are much more stronger and they exert much uh more of a response right so the signs and symptoms you're going to see right you're going to start to see wheezing you're going to start to see dyspnea uh and right uh this uh mast cells right we saw in the air spaces but these mast cells are also located in his skin right and they have the same ig response right we also see this in his gi tract Right, so this is GI tract, and we also see this in his circulation. Right, let me draw it in a red color. In his circulation. So as the more time is spent, right, all of a sudden Ian starts to develop develop urocaria. He starts to develop itching. It starts to complain of GI discomfort. And because as it starts to affect the circulation, right? Slowly, he's, he's not realizing it, but he his blood pressure starts to drop, right? And he's starting to develop diaphoresis, right? So do you, what do you think as the time... Uh, goes by, what do you think is going to start to happen with Ian? Anaphylactic shock? So, so yeah, specifically, right, uh, uh, it's going to be a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. And also, one thing I did not write here, right, the mast cells are also going to secrete neutrophil chemotactic factor and eosinophil chemotactic factor, basophil chemotactic factor. So this is also neutrophil chemotactic factor, eosinophil chemotactic factor, basophil chemotactic factor. Basically, it attracts all these white cells to the site of the inflammation and injury. So you see a lot of neutrophils, you see a lot of basophils, you see a lot of eosinophils uh, migrating towards the area, right? They are coming in uh, into this area. So on top of the goblet cells, hypersecretions of mucus, right, edema formation from uh, capillary leakage, right, bronchoconstriction from both spasmogenic effects of histamine and leukotrienes, right, uh, he's, he's getting worse and worse, right, and the more these mast cells degranulate, right, we see more effects on the skin, we see more effects of the GI tract, you know, GI discomfort, we see, you know, blood pressure changes, hypotension, right, diaphoresis, right, and the sympathetic nervous system response, where his heart rate starts to elevate, his breathing starts to increase, right? Uh, and all those factors are starting to develop. So uh, before, you know, but but Ian is lucky, right? He's lucky because he's surrounded by, now by all the graduate paramedic students who have, you know, graduated with him. So all of them know what to do, right? So what are you guys going to do? Might help me. <laughs> Not help you, right? That's so what do you guys think you're gonna do for him? We're gonna get some epinephrine for him. Exactly, right? And I know some of you guys uh you know probably carry it in your in your uh, uh Batman belt that you have around your waist. 
So you're going to pull out that Epi, EpiPen, right? And you're going to hit him with it, right? But what else, right? Let's, let, let's, let's say uh, from the stuff we talked about, right? Uh, what type of medications, right, do you think would be effective in this case? Benadryl. Benadryl, how so? It's a, I think Benadryl is an antihistamine. Correct, right? So Benadryl is an antihistamine. Very good. What else? Uh, what were you saying, Lindsay? Prednisone? Yeah, excellent. Prednisone, steroid, right? So it's yes. going to reduce edema formation. It's going to reduce the inflammatory process, right? Uh, but that's going to start to work over several hours. What else can we give them? How about a duo neb? Nebulizer. How, and how does that going to help you? Well, butyrol is a facial dilator, and then uh, ipotropium will get rid of the secretion. Yeah, so ipotropium and albuterol, right, combivant, is going to be a beta-2 agonist with albuterol. It's going to be bronchial smooth muscle dilator. And then the ipotropium is going to uh, basically dry you up from the goblet cells, right? Very good. There's another medication. You guys, we, as paramedics, we don't carry it. Uh, you know, patients may be prescribed that. Uh, maybe you guys uh, heard of this medication called uh, Monte Lucast. Right, that's singular. And you saw the commercials on, uh, uh, you know, on TV, right? Monte Lucas or singular. So that medication uh, is leukotriene, right? Leukotriene receptor blocker or antagonist. Leukotriene receptor antagonist, so it blocks these leukotrienes, right? Which is also a very strong spasmogenic effect right but ov overall right you were guys you were guys uh, on point in terms of your treatment but uh what's the whole purpose of the story so the whole purpose of the story we this is essentially your adaptive immune response right so what is adaptive immune response adaptive immune response is this right so a foreign bacteria pathogen comes in right and your body doesn't uh, is unable to process it properly or processes it improperly right and uh, it expresses it on the cell surface. So uh, in the case of, let's say, if it was a bacteria, right, bacteria, uh, and the body could not phagocytize it with, let's say, neutrophils and macrophages, a macrophage will express it on the cell surface, bring it to a T helper cell, and say, T helper cell, I need you to, to basically secrete your cytokines in order to, for the body to build the adaptive immunity, we need to make, we need to make specific antibodies. So the T cell then starts to, first it secretes interleukin type 2, right? It will act on itself. It's going to send it into clonal expansion of the T cells. So it makes more T cells. It makes also interleukin type 4 and 5. Type 4 is going to act on a B cell, B lymphocyte. And if the pollen binds to these, right, antibodies that are specifically for these epitopes on these antigens, it's going to send this into clonal expansion of B cells. And then interleukin-5 uh, is going to act on these cells to basically change them into plasma cells. Plasma cells are just active B cells. And the moment they become active B cells, they're going to start to make specific antibodies against that particular bacteria, pollen, uh, virus, right? Um, um, fungi, um, you know, the foreign invader. And now, right, these antibodies are going to come and they could do different things. So in the, in the Ian's case, right, this was an appropriate response. They came on the mast cells because it was IgE specific and the mast cells degranulate, they release their contents, which we saw histamine, leukotrienes, right, and all those effects. However, uh, in the case of bacteria, what happened, let's say this was a foreign bacteria and we, we made, let's say, IgE, uh, not IgE, we, we made IgM, IgM or IgG, different type of antibodies, and we code it on the cell surface. So this uh, can signal other um, immune response cells, right, to come, like obstinant system, right, where you have uh, uh, obstinant system, a complement system, where a complement system can come, and they will basically now know that this, this particular cell is marked for destruction because these antibodies are expressed on the cell surface. So these IgM, IgG antibodies mark that foreign bacteria 
as target for attack. So let's say a complement system can come, they can basically make holes or pores in the cell and, and destroy the cell. So this is again adaptive immune response. It usually takes 10 to 15 days for your body to produce these antibodies. And depending on what this is, right, it can exert different effects. So in the case of, of let's say, pollen grains, it's usually, you know, a foreign uh, uh, antigen that comes in. The body can basically make these mast cells where they degranulate. You have type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, right? So this is basically your, your true allergic reaction. This is a similar response to someone who has uh, uh, asthma reaction to, let's say, uh, inhaling... Uh, roach dander or inhaling pollution right um especially in the bronx why such high uh, asthma rate very near to a lot of uh highways right uh, and a, a lot of uh inhaling of, of these pollu pollution also you know if you live in buildings where there's a lot of roach dander right you inhale this your body processes this and the same response you get right ig response so this is basically your adaptive immune response uh, that takes place, right? It's not innate uh, immunity because innate immunity is your first line of defense. When your innate immunity is no longer able to mount a response, then your body starts to go into the adaptive immunity, which is mediated by B and T cell uh, uh, clonal expansion, right? And the purpose of this is basically you want to make the antibodies, right? So this is, I kind of uh, have used the same slides, right? But maybe... This will help you understand. This is going to be a little bit more detailed, right? So let's say this was Ian. This was the garden where the, he had his barbecue. Let's say this was the grain pollens he unfortunately inhaled, right? So pollen inhaled. And this is this shows you a macrophage basically engulfing, right? Uh, that a foreign particle. And unfortunately, right, uh, he's, they're going to express it on the cell surface, right? This is just shows you the innate immunity versus adaptive immunity, right? So we see uh, initially, right, the in, innate immunity is the first level of response. We have the skin barrier, we have the mucous membranes, right? And then you have your neutrophils, you have your, which are your phagocytic cells, neutrophils, your eosinophils, right? Uh, monocytes or macrophages, you have your natural killer cells, right? And it mounts your inflammatory response. If this is not good enough, meaning it's not, it doesn't, address the problem then we have the b and t cells right cell mediated response uh and we start to make antibodies against it right so kind of talked about right neutrophils will be the first response this is part of your innate immunity right uh, also macrophages but if it doesn't work right we have to mount a response to it uh, so this is where they're made in your right axial skeleton as i said right and uh we talked about right all of this specifically the antigen presenting cells are D cells, macrophage and the dendritic cells. Right uh, inside the blood, they're known as the monocyte. So they will process the antigen. Right, that, that's what we call antigen presenting cells, and then they're going to then bring it to the T lymphocyte, and then the T lymphocyte is going to uh, signal the B lymphocyte to become active, to become the plasma cell to start to make these particular uh, antibodies. Right. So this is how it all is formed, right? You see the B and T lymphocytes in your lymph uh, system, right? Lymphatic system. So this here shows you the normal, the normal response, what should happen, right? You have the pathogen that came in, right? The pseudopods of the macrophage, they will grab the pathogen, bring it inside in this vacuole. And those enzymes that are found, they're going to fuse with this vacuole and basically... Uh, break that pathogen up and then the debris are released. This is normal response, right? But unfortunately, in Ian's case, that did not happen, right? So let me go to, to what happened in his response. In Ian's response, he took this into his system and his macrophages inappropriately marked it on the cell surface, right? So we see basically that this pathogen came in, right? So antigen presenting cell is just means your monocyte or macrophage, right? It expressed it on the cell surface with type 2 MHC molecule, right? This is what you see. And this is here is the CD4 on the on the helper T cell, right? So CD4, uh, and this is your 
T cell receptor, right? So it bound, and the T cell is now going to sell signals to basically become uh, expanded, clonal expansion of the T cells, right? And we're going to see what's going to happen. So just again, right? The pathogen came in into the macrophage in order for normal destruction, but it didn't phagocytize it. Instead, it expressed it on the cell, cell surface, right? And then it bound with the T helper cell, right? The T helper cell becomes activated, right? So activated T helper cell is going to send these cytokines, which we talked about, interleukin type 4 and 5. It's going to send these signals to the B cell, and it's going to say to the B cell, B cell, we need you to activate, uh, turn into plasma cell, right? Uh, and the plasma cells are now going to make these antibodies. And then once these antibodies are made, right, you're also going to create memory B cells for your subsequent exposure. So let's say Ian unfortunately decides to go to that garden a third time, right? Uh, same, the same pollen grains, right? But now he already has memory B cells. So now his response will be way more exaggerated than his second exposure. That's why, uh, you know, your, your subsequent exposure to your incited um, allergen is much stronger. Uh, same thing like with bee stings or, you, you know, someone has a, you know allergy like peanuts or something like that, right? The subsequent responses is a way, way stronger because you already uh, made these memory cells that already has these uh, antibodies there. So these are the antibody classes, right? Uh, you don't you don't need to remember all of them, but the ones I would definitely remember is IgE, right, for your type one hypersensitivity reaction, IgM and IgG, right. A good remember, good way to remember is General Motors. This is usually found in type two and type three hypersensitivity reactions, right. Um, they are slightly different uh, for, for our purposes. Uh, type one is what we want to con concentrate because this is can be a dire emergency. Not that the other ones are not, but you will encounter this much more frequently. Right. So what are what are these antibodies? So essentially, they are these immunoglobulins. They have uh, antigen binding sites. Right. Uh, they specifically look for that antigen epitope, specific marker, right, on the antigen, and they're going to be specific to that particular pollen grain, bacteria, virus, uh, you know, fungi uh, that they are made against, right? So they're very, very specific. This is part of your adaptive immune response, right? And what they're going to do is the moment they found, so they found these specific uh, antigen uh, receptors, they're going to bind to that, uh, to the epitope, and it can do different things, right? It can, these can, this antibodies can signal uh, that this cell is up for destruction, or it can signal mast cells to degranulate or other functions, right? Basically, they're signaling that this is a, a, a cell that's foreign, that's not the cell that's uh, normal, right? Something is going on here. So here we see antibodies attaching to this antigen, and then the response, right, will basically uh, be whatever, you know, maybe maybe the complement, complement system comes and it's going to make holes in, in the cells to destroy it, right? So one example. So this here shows you the first exposure, right? The first exposure, the allergen fragment came in, macrophage basically phagocytizes it, it, right? And then uh, it's going to express it on the cell surface, right? With the help of T helper cell, it's going to signal B cells to become activated, right? B cells is activated. It's called the plasma cell. And we made these antibodies. Antibodies are made. Let's talk about second exposure, right? Subsequent exposure. So Ian goes back to that garden, but now he, he, his mast cells and basophils already have these IgE on the cell surface because his body's already made these, right? And now, again, this pollen grain comes in. It's going to bound to these antibodies, and these mast cells are going to degranulate, right? When they degranulate, they're going to release histamines, leukotrienes, right? Uh, and uh, they're going to basically cause all these responses that we saw uh, on this that I was drawing for you guys, right? So we're going to see histamine. It's very spasmogenic. It's a strong vasodilator, right? It's going to uh, increase mucus production from the goblet cells. Leukotrienes are also spasmogenic. They cause bronchoconstriction. So you will see all these effects taking place in all the locations the mast cells are. 
which wore, right, the skin, the lungs, GI tract, that's why people have GI complaints in the, you know, circulatory system, right? You see circulatory collapse, right? So blood pressure drops, uh, he's going to start to uh, form sweat, right? So this is what we saw, right? Uh, so it, if it goes to the point where it becomes systemic, you're going to basically see anaphylaxis, right? So it's basically you, you have itching, swelling, difficulty breathing, airway constriction, right? It, it became systemic. So this pollen grain has spread in his body to all places where he has mast cells, and mast cells are found all over your connective tissues. And now he's sens sensitized because his body's already made those uh, IgE, right, antibodies that are now on the mast cell surface. So initial exposure, he makes, he makes antibodies, and the subsequent exposure, the mast cells degranulate. So then all the effects are seen. Take takes about 10 to 15 days to uh, develop these antibodies, right? So here shows you basically a graph, right? This was the primary response to antigen A, right? So takes about, you know, you know, shows you, let's say, day seven. Uh, so exposure maybe occurred day one, right? And then on day 14, right, you make uh, all these antibodies, right? And then he has a second exposure to the same antigen, but you see how heightened his response is. So this could be a life or dire emergency, right, if we don't address it. But if, if let's say, let's say there's another uh, flower that starts to bloom, and it's a different pollen, and it came in, in his side, his body, unfortunately, Ian starts to make another set of antibodies against it. He's not going to mount a response to it just yet. In 14 days, right, he may do it again, right, if his... Uh, uh, Macrophages, again, inappropriately express it. But this is what we are worried about, is the subsequent exposure where your immune response is very heightened, right? Uh, and that's, that could be, uh, you know, a medical emergency um, that we need to address, right? So any questions so far about anything? I have one. Uh, help me have a question? Yes. Go ahead. Then whatever who got the bowling greens he has developed an allergy to this bowling all the time after yes after correct yeah uh, after afterwards he they will have allergy to it why because now right all his all his mast cells are now loaded with that specific antibody against the particular pollen grain or whatever the foreign uh antigen was so yes that person will be now sensitized forever Thank you. Yep. So this, so this is just uh, uh, shows you, right, the cell-mediated immune response. Uh, same thing we, we talked about, right? Allergen comes in, antigen-presenting cell, right, presented to the T helper cell, and then, right, the B cell starts to uh, clonally expand, right? Uh, we also make cytotoxic T cells, right, that could attack that uh, foreign invader as well, right? Here it shows you a micros microscope picture, right, of antigen presenting cells, right, which is, will be your macrophage or your dendritic cell, right, and the lymphocyte, right, let's say this is the T lymphocyte, how it docks, right, and then the T lymphocyte basically uh, will signal the B cell. Uh, and then in the the second antigen exposure, right, that's when the problem is now. You have the memory cells, right, which already are preloaded, right, and then the plasma cells, which already made antibodies. So you will have uh, extremely, extremely uh, heightened response from your body, right? So second exposure, right, and that's what we see. So what we see essentially in your lungs, right, this is what I was drawing you a diagram. Initially, right, hopefully the goblet cells make the mucus and they sweep the pathogen to your lungs uh, up to up into your trachea and gets you know digested in your stomach but unfortunately let's say it doesn't happen right so then these right uh, alveolar macrophages you see here right so alveolar macrophages are constantly patrolling in your uh, respiratory tracts right in in your air spaces and they're looking for that foreign foreign body foreign invader 
hopefully they could phagocytize it, but sometimes inappropriately, you know, they will express it. And then you have all these, you know, secondary effects. And you could see right on the, in your respiratory system, right? If the, you have the histamine release, if you have the leukotriene release, how this will cause, right, uh, sp sp spasmogenic effects, goblet cells will rec uh, re release, right, uh, mucus, you will have uh, uh, these, right, vessels, the capillaries, they're going to start leak, to leak, and you see edema formation, right, this is where the steroids comes in to re basically uh, stop that long-term effect. Leukotrienes are going to work on your bronchial smooth muscle to basically bronchoconstrict, so that's why we give all those medications to basically stop that process. And we attack it from different angles, right? You attack it from different receptors, different angles uh, to correct this problem that's causing. Why? Because uh, these mast cells are not only in your lungs, they're all over your body. So we attack at different angles, different receptors, Benadryl antihistamine, uh, Monte Luca Singular for your leukotriene receptor blocker. Uh, we, we could give you uh, epinephrine, right? Uh, beta 2 stimulate stimulator, beta-1 stimulator, alpha-1 vasoconstrictor, right? Uh, we could also give you uh, max sulfate, smooth muscle relaxer, right? So we attack from different angles to uh, counteract the problem, right? This is just uh, from your remote protocol, right? Uh, in your type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, right? You, you see basically all these drugs that I just talked about, right? You have your steroids, you have your api, you have your antihistamine medication, right? Uh, you have your albuterol medication, you could also give IV fluids if you have hypotension, right? And you could also give pressors to, to bring the blood pressure up. So uh, this is how you want to look at your medications, the route of action, right? And correlate the normal physiology and then uh, what happens when you have pathological condition and how they're going to exert their effects, right? So this is why we have all these medications here, right? Uh, definitely a good idea to, you know, make flashcards and, you know, review the medications and doses for your future uh, exams, you know, like REMAC exam, for example. Right? Uh, this is just some of the treatments I will, you know, I'll, I wanted to ask you guys, right? So let's say you have a, you have a patient who does, in fact, is having... Um, an anaphylactic type 1 reaction, you decide to, you know, give them some albuterol, right? Which one of these are going to be more effective? So I could con I could take, in, in the initial phase, obviously we're going to give them oxygen, right, in the primary assessment. But then the moment we decide to basically administer our, right, uh, nebulizer, right? So we decided to give the albuterol medications. Which one do you think will be more effective? If I take my albuterol and I mix it in here, right, in the nebulizer with a T-piece connection like this, or I disconnect this from the face mask and I basically connect my nebulizer in here. Which one do you think, number one or number two would be more effective? Number two. And why? Uh, why crystal? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure why. But but you said you think it's number two is more effective though. But you I see this, you see this quite friend, often, right? You see this quite often yeah. where. So so are you saying number two because you see it often in the field? Yes. Yeah. So, so just because you see you see it often in the field does not always make it the most effective, right? So I can tell I can tell you, number one is the most effective. Number two is not effective, but I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm gonna remove number two from my arsenal, but in terms of your delivery of the medication, in terms of the efficacy, number one is more effective, right? Does anyone does anyone? Uh, Wanna, you know, come in and give their, you know, uh, sight before I give you the answer. Why do you think one is more effective? 
Um, I, I'm assuming because with two, the medication doesn't go directly into their lungs. With like one, it like goes directly into the lungs because they're inhaling it like straight in, kind of. Right? Okay, you're on the right path. But why? Why am I not removing number two? Like, why not? Why not? If if I I I, I will show you that number one is more effective. There's studies that show number one is more effective. Why am I not just removing number two? Because sometimes people like uh, they can't really hold the nebulizer if they're in a lot of distress. Number two is a good option. Right. So very, yeah. Yeah. So sad. Right. You're right on the money. Right. So a lot of times you guys see this in the field. Right. And you assume number two is more effective. So number two is not more effective. The reason why number one is more effective is that you want to you want to coach the patient to seal their lips right around the teepees. Right. You want to tell them to inhale as deep as possible and hold the breath in so that the medication that's nebulized reaches their lungs. And then it exerts their effects, right, via beta-2 receptor. Uh, uh, and it gets, it, you want to you wanna have this medication to reach your bronchial smooth muscle. This is where your beta-2 receptors are. With this method, if you don't coach the patient, you just throw their on their face, and the patient doesn't know what they're doing, the medication is just going to collect around the mouth and the throat. It's never going to reach the intended site, right? So this is the only reason why this is more effective. You have to coach the patient. You're not just going to put this in their mouth and tell them to figure it out. You have to coach the patient how to do that. So seal your lips, take a big breath in, hold it, right? And then exhale. So the medication reaches the target site. This one, right? Why I do not throw it out is that you may have those patients who may be in the initial phase, they may be somewhat uh, anxious. They may not be fully alert, right? To understand your direction. Or you may be in the house, right? or in the restaurant where this is occurring and I want to get them out of there and I want to move them to my ambulance. And the patient may be reaching out or doing stuff and I don't want them to do that. So in the initial phases, I may connect my nebulizer to the face mask up until I have to move them to my ambulance, right? The moment I move them to my ambulance, I remove this and I switch to the TPs. And then you have to sit down and coach them through the procedure. You have to tell them what to do, right? And that takes time, right? Uh, in the moment of movement, right, where I got to get them to the ambulance, you know, in a fast uh, or safe manner so they don't reach out, I don't have the time to explain just yet, I will put this, but this is only temporary measure, right? This is way more effective. So don't keep them on this because if the patient doesn't know what they're doing, you're just going to give them inline nebs. You're not going to correct their problem because they're never taking the medication all the way down to the lungs. The medication is collecting in the mouth, right, and the throat. So, so, so this is right. This is way more effective. Uh, uh, this here is just for the initial phase, right? This was the study, right? Uh, mouthpiece versus face mask. They looked at uh, in the childhood in the childhood asthma. So they basically uh, tested, right? So they said the mouthpiece, right, which is essentially the T piece, right, was significantly better. Uh, they had they measured what's known as Ford expiratory volume. When the person exhales forcefully for one se uh, for one second, and they measured that, uh, uh, and they basically also measured the for the forced vital capacity. What that means is that if you forcefully blow your air out and you are more bronchodilated, you're going to move more force and you're going to move more air, right? As opposed to your bronchoconstricted, there's less amount of force and air you're able to move. So what they found is that those who had the mouthpiece, right? After provision of their nebulizer, right, uh, uh, this is what they had. So their, the scores were for uh, forced expiratory volume in one second was 56.3 plus minus 32.6% versus 28.9 plus minus 19.1. So uh, the nebulizer therapy, right, for bronchial asthma was much more effective with the mouthpiece uh, uh, as opposed to... Uh, you know, just throwing that with the face mask, that makes sense because face mask, they, they could just breathe in the, in the mouth and throat and the medication is not being delivered, right? So so choose this one, right? Explain to the patient uh, how much you're going to run it, right? We usually say six liters per minute, right? Uh, so if you connect your nebulizer, do not run it at 15 liters per minute. You want to deliver it between five and nine liters per minute. We usually run at six and this will give you the correct nebulization rate, right? Uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 mLs per minute. Right, this is what we're looking for. And this is what, uh, if a patient is prescribed it in the asthma setting, right? This is called the peak flow meter, right? 
uh, the doctor will basically tell them their parameters. Let's say they said here, right? You see uh, 450 to, um, let's say, uh, 275, right? So the patient is going to blow in, into this when they feel like they have, uh, you know, a, an episode of asthma. They'll blow in this three times. They're going to get a, they're going to record the best score. So when they blow ex, um, very hard out of this device, this needle moves up like that. So if, if it moves and it's in the green zone, you see how from this is the green zone. So anything here is the green zone, right? So if, if this dial moves and it's in the green zone, they say, you know, you're fine for the patient. If it, it's in the yellow zone somewhere here, right, which this is this is in the yellow zone, they, they instruct the patient to take the dose of his rescue inhaler. And if, if this is in the red zone, they tell the patient to take the dose of his res, rescue inhaler and call 911 immediately. So if you come in and the patient says, uh, you know, they show you this and it's in the red zone, I'd be very worried, all right, because those are the patients that may need to get intubated, they may need ICU admission. Right. If they're in the yellow zone, I wouldn't, you know, celebrate. Right. But know that you, your time is of the essence. You need to give them nebulizer. Make sure you coach them through it so they do the proper inhalation. Goes to the lungs. Right. Don't just throw the face mask on them, and you know that's all you do. Right. But so the three zones. So green zone. This is yellow zone. This is red zone. This is called the peak flow meter. Right. Uh, if a person has an asthma, they'll they'll probably be prescribed this by their provider. Uh, if they didn't use it, you could try to see, right, if you are assessing them and they're not to the point where, you know, they're really, really bad, you could have them blow into it th three times, take the, the best of three tries um, and document it so you know where they're at, right? So this is what, what this is. This is what I was explaining to yeah, you, right? Nick? Yeah. Um, so for patients with asthma, is the pulse ox a reliable tool? It, it, it's a it's a reliable tool, but Bullsox is not gonna tell you uh, the level of bronchoconstriction. It will tell you the level of hemoglobin saturation with oxygen. So you may have a patient who has a profound bronchoconstriction. His Bullsox may still read, you know, in the normal range. But this will tell you the level of bronchoconstriction, because the moment your airways start to narrow, you're not gonna be able to produce, you know, uh, this um, this this thing here, right? You're not going to be able to have forced expiratory volume. You're not going to be able to get adequate amount. So with bronchoconstriction, right, this dial may be in the yellow zone or the red zone. So what this is basically is this, right? So this is the graph they measure. This is your forced vital capacity. This is over one second. And they, they basically do uh, a fraction of this, right? They divide over one second of a forced vital capacity. And if it's 80% uh, or greater, you're doing fine. If it's below this number, right, like 50%, 40%, right, you have profound bronchoconstriction. But for your purposes, right, uh, you're not going to be really doing the formula in the field. Uh, what, you're gonna, what you can use is this if the patient has it. All right. Any other questions? So this is, so these are the terms, right? So FE, FEV1, right? This is forced expiratory volume over one second. And then they do uh, um, your uh, vital capacity, forced vital capacity, right? And then divide this, right? Uh, if this number dips under 70%, right? Then you have airflow obstruction. 80% uh, is usually you are in the normal range. Right, so you see the time, right? One second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. So what they basically do is when they connect the patient to the spirometer, when they do this, they tell the patient, take a deep breath in and then exhale as forcefully, as strongly as you possibly can, right? Get your, the entire breaths out. They'll take the measurement over one second. That will be FEV1. And then when they get the entire breath out, this will be FVC, right? The uh, forced vital capacity, the full amount. And then they'll get this formula. Right, and then they could basically, you know, set these numbers for the patient. Right, so uh, ALS treatments, right, we already kind of talked about in terms of what we're going to give, in terms of epinephrine, um, about steroids, right, um, 
and max sulfate is a bronco smooth muscle dilator right uh so any questions so far the other stuff they want to talk about while we are here right this was in your new protocols but uh, i think i touched upon this before there's something no, known in septus sepsis right septic shock sepsis before we get to that level there's something known as SERS criteria right so this is uh, known as your SERS. SERS stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. This is taken directly from your New York City REMAC protocols, right? So they, the, this criteria is basically for patients who you believe uh, are septic or may lead to potential sepsis, right, septic shock. So here they, they'll show you, right, the important factors specifically to the lecture we talked about, right? We see the white blood cells. So what does it mean if their white blood cell is greater than 12,000 12, per cubic millimeter? Is it infection? Uh, Crystal, what were you saying? That there's an infection? Yeah, so, so you're basically, your body's starting to make more white blood cells, or maybe neutrophils, right, to come for the source of infection. Then we talked about greater than 10% of band cells, right? Band cells were immature white blood cells that are being dumped into your circulation. But my question is now why you may have an elevation of white cells and you also could have, right, uh, th this called leukopenia, right? Leukopenia or, or neutropenia, right? Poverty of the cells. Why, why you will have low count? So you may have elevation, right? We said an acute infection, then you could have a low count. There is suppression of the bone marrow because of sepsis. So what is it? What were you saying, Halmi? There is suppression of the yes, bone. Yes, yes, excellent. So one could be suppression of the bone marrow. Your bone marrow is not making, what else? It could be like uh, towards the end of your infection, like if you're very septic, you could have been elevated, but now you're coming down. Yeah, your your cells are being used used up, like your neutrophils are being used up. They they basically uh, are coming out of the circulation and they're going towards the area of the infection, right? And uh, they call it netosis. I'll show you some slides. They basically they make they they accumulate with platelets, right? And they get used up, right? Uh, in fighting the bacteria in order to phagocytize it. We said neutrophils, are, uh, you know, phagos, they perform phagocytosis, so they could be used up. So one could be acute in infection, you have elevation of these cells. One could be they're being used up or your bone marrow suppression, you're not making enough cells, right? So you could be later in the process. The other thing we talked about, not in this lecture, but we talked about, right, point of care lactate. Why is this important? It it's, it shows how hypoxic your tissues are. So so exactly you 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 showing you showing uh, anaerobic right metabolism right. Remember we said uh, normally your mitochondria wants to make uh, you, you wants to take right your pyruvate into the electron transport chain. That is if you have oxygen. But if you do not have oxygen, that pyruvate doesn't go into the mitochondria. Is not made uh, into ATP in the electron transport chain. We basically go. Uh, glucose into right pyruvate and instead we go into lactate that's without oxygen and we have elevation in the lactate level so patient becoming uh, acidotic we, so we say it, lactic acidosis may be developing right so we talked about that that's why we see those uh, in their lab labs right so these are the labs that are important right so this is what I was talking about right why uh, this low count, right, less than 4,000, is that you have this process of, they call it netosis, your, your neutrophil, right, they basically leave the circulation, they're going to combine with platelets, and uh, they have this neutrophil lustase that they secrete, come with platelets, they, may, they come out of the circulation in order to fight this bacteria. So they say this co concept is basically, they see this, right, this concept of netosis, where your white blood cells are decreased, decreased counts of white blood cells or neutrophils. It happens in the inflammatory response, especially in things uh, like sepsis, right? And what happens is basically they're used up, 
right? And uh, why? Because they they migrate out the circulation circulated blood, right? Uh, so we see this in severe bacteremia, right? Uh, where they're being used up, and here we see right in the cy cytopenia, especially during sepsis, from decreased bone marrow production, like uh, Halmi was saying, right? Suppression of of bone marrow, and we also have increased destruction of these. Uh, neutrophil secondary to this concept of netosis, right? Uh, and this was published in one of the studies of leukopenia. By the way, if you have, if you have re reduced white count, you have worse prognosis. So you have less chance of survival from sepsis if your white cells are count is low. Uh, we call it leukopenia, right? Leukopenia for poverty. Uh, 